Thanks to Ellen and the Volumetric Society and ThoughtWorks for having us here tonight. Um, I, uh, I did come to Hardware Hack Lab uh, for a side project I was interested in with Connect and Oculus, and I think someday I'll get back to it. But um, I'm excited to show you what we've done with Connect 2, um, and also to share some of um, share some of our code uh, to share some of our code with you, which might be of interest to kind of future hackers. So let's uh, get out of your way. way. Okay. Uh, so uh, first, I want to talk a little about the motivation for what we're doing. Um, uh, a body, our, our company makes makes body models, and uh, what a body model is is a regular collection of points about the body. Uh, it's information about the body, like it can move. It has like landmarks all over it. Um, it can change change shape. You can measure it. So it's sort of like on the left here. I have a that's a point cloud. So that's just like messy sensor data. But you put that into a CAD program and try to simulate clothing around it, and it's like I can't do anything with that. So what we do is we take the scan data and turn it into a body model. Um, and you can use it for apparel design. You can use it for animation. Um, at the point that you want to interface a human in the real world into a computer, that's like where our technology. Our core technology lives. Oh. I should have run the animation. So you can see that the model on the right, the scan can't move, but the model on, on the model on the right can change shape and pose, which you'll see in a second. Right. So from one scan, we're able to to sort of produce different poses. So here's a here's a more maybe more fun example. Of, uh, of such a thing. Oops, this was uh, Eric who was just here. Um, so here we've actually taken a scan from the Kinect and the scan of Eric's face. We've dressed it in a character creation program and then we've, we were able to choose one of these animations from Mixamo, which is an um, automatic rigging company. So once you get your model out of the Kinect, you can put it into uh, put it through an animation system. You can rig it up with a skeleton in your video game in a video game platform like Unity. Um, yeah, so there are definitely some interesting, interesting uses of body models. Um, yeah, so I want to talk. I said I would talk a little bit about the difference between the original Connect and the Connect Two, which I think is of interest to like hardware hackers. Um, Microsoft is calling it more sensitive sensor, which is sort of cute. <laughs> Uh, we found that the depth data off the sensor, the 3D depth data, is much more usable. It's um, much uh, much more precise and accurate. The Connect V1 sensor, the, it was discretized, so like you would get points here and points here, and no points in between. The new sensor is much better in that regard. Um, I think the most exciting thing about the new sensor, from like a hacking perspective, is the skeleton data. Microsoft put a lot of a lot of en major engineering work into getting really accurate skeleton. Or, in, or yeah, pretty good, pretty accurate skeleton data off the sensor. So if you're just trying to find out, like, are there people in front of you, and where are they, and what are they doing, um, you can get really far by just using the skeleton data without having to write your own computer vision code, which, as Matt can tell you, computer vision is hard. So getting a nice interface like the skeleton is a, is a really kind of great starting point um, for things to work with. Um, I'm not sure what else to say about the sensor. I can answer questions at the end if you have sort of specific questions. The color image is, is more high res and sort of wider. Um, the infrared and the infrared and the, the, the infrared is new. Is that right? Um, no. No. But the infrared and the depth are in the same place on the sensor. So they're more they're, they're I think the alignment of the of the cameras is a little bit more usable. But maybe do you have anything you want to add about the new sensor being better? It, it, it's much better. I th doing computer vision with the new sensor is, is much easier, um, but it's still very challenging. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, and the sensor's out. It's in public beta now. They're $200, so it's a great, like, if you're doing something that requires people at home to use the sensor, it's like, that's a very sort of possible, possible thing to do. Can I ask uh, how well it distinguishes between different Yeah, it's so the, the, the sensor is designed to track up to six people. I think it does a pretty good job of that. Um, uh, I would say it's pretty good. It's not less good on the floor. It det its floor detection is really like, I mean, it might be 10 centimeters below the floor where it thinks the floor is. It's very, very rough. Um, but it does it other than sort of like the edges of the feet. It actually, this, the sort of segmentation, the like what part of it, what you're seeing is a person and what part is not, I've, I've found to be, as a first pass, really good. Um, in terms of actually doing anything with like the depth data, it's like, 
not good enough. But it's a great starting point for like if you're doing like a, a green screen type video, um, it can get you pretty far. This is a, just a basic block diagram of our app. The, the, the approach that we took was, particularly since we're, uh, our, our company is, uh, most of our code is in Python. We're sort of like math, math, pretty mathy. We're not Windows developers. We don't use Windows at all except for this. Um, so the approach we took with the app is to just record data, design a really efficient way of recording data in the app, and also queuing the person being scanned and like the operator, if there is one, on how to have the person stand in the right way. So we've implemented certain kinds of validation on the, in the app, like counting how many people are in the frame, where they're positioned in the frame, the pose, um, their feet being all the way in or their head being all the way in. Things that it's really easy to do, really, with the skeleton. <laughs> Things we can do with the skeleton is kind of what we're doing in the app. And then everything else we send to BodyHub, which is our uh, kind of like, we're on uh, Amazon Cloud uh, on EC2. Uh, the fitting, the fitting code runs on EC2, and BodyHub is just a, our sort of web web service where you go to get your body model. Not too much to say there, and I'm happy to say that that nearly an hour ago <laughs> we published uh, the framework that we use for our app. So if you're if you're hacking and you want to sort of uh, get started playing, like if you want to put up, um, you know, the Microsoft has a few samples, and what our sample Monocle does. Adds to that, it's pretty pretty small in some ways. It'll like you can see the color image and the, and the skeleton together. You can also write all the data out. So if you want to save like a frame of data to disk, you can do that in in something like like 300 lines of code. Monocle is an app that's like 300 lines of code that does all of that, like serialization, visualization with a few options. So um, this are really this is just an initial release that I was really aiming to get together so I could share it with you all tonight. Um, so there's more to come. And you know, pull requests really welcome. Uh, hopefully, I'll be back to Hack Lab and get a chance to use it some more. Yeah. Does that work for the original Connect? It does not. Yeah, no. it does not at all. Oh, so do you have anything? Because that's all. That's what I have. Yeah. Do no, I'm sorry. It's but I think there are sensors available at Hardware Hack Lab. Uh, the V2 sensors. Yeah. This is all for the V2 S. The, the latest public release of the V2 SDK. And if you're on the developer program, you could use the developer SDK as well. But the public SDK will work here. So. Oh, is there another question? Yeah, it's a great question. Maybe, um, so at the end I'll show a demo so you can see a little what the user experience is like. And maybe Matt can talk a, a, a little bit about the sort of how we work with the data and the, the data across multiple frames. Sure. So I think one natural question is what makes this problem hard, right? So the Connect, as it's designed, is mostly used for tracking bodies. So this uh, saying, oh, well, we can, you know, do something with bodies with the Connect, well, that, that might seem easy. But what the Connect is really giving you are skeletons, right? Really approximations to pose. They're not giving you a detailed surface model of your body. And they're certainly not giving you a reposable one. Um, so whereas uh, Connect, say, gives you skeletons and Connect Fusion gives you uh, dense geometry, what we really want to give you is bodies, right? We want to give you uh, something with correspondences uh, that allow you to change shape and pose and measure and uh, we'd like to do texture and there are all kinds of, of possible uh, things that we can do here. So um, points are not bodies, right? So this scan here uh, is just is a collection of data points but it doesn't imply necessarily where everything is. Uh, only having a single connect is a little bit of a problem, right? So you only get the person from one perspective. So if you want their whole body you end up having to um, to combine multiple captures, so that's a little bit challenging. And then um, and the, the, the data itself can be kind of noisy, especially near the feet, uh, where there are some ambiguities about where the floor ends and where uh, the feet begin. Um, yeah. So the big tool that we have in our toolbox uh, is this parametric model of, uh, of people. And what it does is it allows you to, uh, to, to create a mesh from a set of parameters 
and it's factored into shape and pose components. So what that allows you to do is to control the shape of a body model independently from its pose. Um, and we've been working for many years on, uh, on making this good. It's, it's a hard problem just to make the, make the model. Like many companies, uh, we use big data. Uh, we have uh, collected thousands of laser scans in order to train this parametric body model. Um, but these laser scans are not bodies, right? These laser scans are just point clouds. They're not necessarily annotated with what these points mean, and so we have to um, do something with them to go from uh, scans to a model. So we have to solve the registration problem. Well, what is the registration problem? The registration problem is just being able to talk about correspondences um, between different uh, scans or different meshes. So if we look at, say, um, this point uh, or this point on this scan, does it correspond to this point or to this other point? Right? So um, a lot of the challenge in building this model is about uh, dealing with these, dealing with registration and dealing with these, these correspondences. So our solution to this, uh, well, I, I should also say that there's a, a bit of a chicken and egg problem in that given all these scans, you'd like to register uh, a model to them, but without a good model, it's hard to get the registrations, and without the registrations, it's hard to build a good model. So what we do is we essentially have an iterative process which goes back and forth between improving the body model um, and improving the registrations that we have to scan. Um, and that results in uh, something like this. So you can see these are static scans which were taken. And uh, these are, re are our registrations to those scans. Right? So we have a, a template which has been deformed in order to minimize the, the distance between the templates and the scans. And then um, these are the models which are uh, interpolating in between these poses. This texture here is uh, something that we would like to, um, to explore further. But one really useful thing about it is it, it helps to, uh, to understand what the right correspondences are. Right? So you can see if someone has a, a tattoo um, in a particular place and then they change pose, you can track that position on the body in order to better understand um, how, the, uh, how the body is moving and what the right correspondences are. Um, and this is showing a little something about our uh, shape space. As I said, the model is factored into shape and pose. And this is showing uh, the principal directions. Let's see, one of them is, yeah, OK. Um, this is showing. Uh, how the body changes when uh, different parameters are adjusted. So we're able to capture um, very large proportions of the variation in the natural population um, through this thing called principal components analysis, which I won't go into now. But basically, we've spent a lot of time trying to um, capture shape, capture pose, and capture the relationship between them so that we can um, capture people's bodies. Um, and then. Back to you. Are the results Question. after this? Hmm? Uh, the results slides after. Just uh, they speaking. may be. They may be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. When a person flexes his hand, for example, does the bicep move? Um, for example, do you account for muscle movement as they change it? That's, that, that, that's a great question. So um, there have been, there's been a lot of work in uh, both sort of trying to physically model every detail of like where the the bones are inside, what the material is, trying to do everything physically. But there's also been a lot of work on um, basically learning what should happen from big data. So if you have thousands of people who are flexing like this, you can learn basically how the surface deforms um, when, when pose changes. Um, and we've found that to be much more efficient than trying to actually infer someone's skeleton. I mean, you know, one thing is that what we have to work with are surfaces. Right? That's all we have. We, we, we don't have x-rays of thousands of people. We only have surfaces. We don't have the fat content. We only have surfaces. So that's why we've put a lot of focus into building a surface model, which is, uh, uh, deforms according to all the data that we've learned. Um, but physical mo more physical modeling is certainly interesting, especially when it comes to uh, 
dynamics and jiggle, and there are some ways in which uh, we may end up going in that direction. So we have some uh, a couple results that we can show you, and then uh, I'll just show you what the scanning experience looks like. But um, there, we also have, if you want to, if you have a Connect to and would like to try this out, there's a promo code here that you can get free, um, five free scans processed. So I'm happy to share that with you guys too. Um, and then you can put those, like I was saying, into Fuse, which is this character creation program. It's probably the easiest way to get something kind of interesting out of the sensor. And that program will do the region. Yeah, it does. It does. It has a lot of a, a library of like clothing and hair and and textures because our model is sort of doesn't include that, and then you can upload it to their site and it, and it does automatic rigging. Um, yeah, so I'm going to run through the results. Sure. Um, so what's being displayed here is just uh, the point cloud, which was captured by the Connect, and then our model, uh, which, which is fit to it. So I don't, I don't know uh, how well you can see that here, but, but there's both points and the model. And the, our reconstruction is... Um, is on top there. And this is from multiple perspectives. Um, one part of the uh, acquisition process is that we need to get people from multiple um, multiple viewpoints, right? We can't recover all your shape just by looking at you from the front. We need to see you from at least the back. Uh, so, um, yeah. So the only, the one. Last one. Uh, yeah, I okay. guess there are just okay. two here. I think okay. we have more uh, we can show if you want, but. Cool. So I should plug this. Definitely. So, so I, um, I'm here, kind of working a bit at Body Labs for the for the summer. But I do most of my work back at the Max Planck Institute, and we're uh, currently um, working on some of those problems. Yeah. But but that's that's not a part of, um, I guess the that's work in progress. I guess I would say. Well, so it certainly helps, and you can, as you can imagine, there are certain poses which would be terrible. It's, I mean, if you like crunch into a small ball and ask it to take your picture and acquire your pose, it's going to work terribly. So, um, putting someone into something like the Da Vinci pose, right, where you where there are as few occlusions as possible, is really um, helpful. Um, but uh, other poses are certainly, you know, it's not necessarily critical that it's exactly that pose. My running's through. Oh, or do you want to you want to pose instead? I, I'll I'll be the, the subject. So, so our first shot captures the background. So if you could just mm -hmm. step to the side for a minute. So we'll just sort of uh, you can imagine that we've cleared out the frame here, but we just sort of capture uh, uh, to get a sort of starting point of what's of what's going on in the room. It's telling us there's problems. It detected some people. We're going to ignore that for right now. Uh, yeah. Yep. So you stand kind of like that in an A pose. <laughs> It's kind of tracking. Let me turn the skeleton on so you can see what the connect is seeing roughly. This green model uh, is just built from a height and weight that the user enters, so it's approximate. So I can't quite see what it's complaining about, but maybe moving. <laughs> okay, so turn to your right. Hold still. Got it. And <laughs> turn facing away. Hold still. Oh, it's probably seeing me. That's what probably it's complaining about. Cool. And facing me. All right. So as he said, there's a back end fitting process which starts with something similar to that green model there, but um, does a lot of work to refine it. Yeah. <laughs> so we get two sort of close-up meshes of the face. It says you're moving that. <laughs> well, I might be. Cool. That's it.
Yeah, so then, so basically, to the question about what we record, we're, we're taking um, we're taking several frames of consecutive data at each of those sort of four points, and then again, <laughs> again for the face. It went to you. Yeah. Um, I could show you also some of the other like visualizations that we have on here. Um, like this is the depth um, that switches. This is the depth. Um, a just sort of a rainbow colored version of the depth of what the sensor sees. You can see the dancing, that's kind of illustrating the noisiness of the sensor. Um, and then if I turn the segmentation on, here it's using this, it's using the player detection to sort of uh, pick which part to highlight. So it's like, it detects where I am and then it's highlighting that part of the depth data and then just sort of dulling everything else. So this is everything in the image that's at about the same depth as me. So you can see there's some people, some people in the, um, and then kind of the same thing, the uh, Blair Witch version. Um, that's not going to work. Here we're seeing the IR and the depth together. I'm not sure if that's, if that's interesting. But um, yeah. Anything else about it? No, I don't think so. Answer any other questions? Yeah, what would you say? So um, that's, that's difficult, right? I mean, so uh, having models of human motion is one thing, right? Being able to simulate someone running or dancing or performing freeform ac actions. But um, both the forward process of simulating something like dancing and the inverse process of trying to see someone dancing in images when there are lots of occlusions and things like that. Um, it can be hard. It's easier if you know what to expect, right? So if you know that you're, what you're going to be seeing is dancing, then of course designing something to, um, uh, to make inferences about that or to generate that is, is easier. Um, but it's, uh, it's challenging. I, w I would say it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a hard problem. I could say one area where we've worked on that is in motion capture systems. So we'll take like motion capture data of someone dancing. Uh, I think that's the area where we've kind of made the most, the most progress. Is the capture complicated at all to make to know the difference by how much clothing and what kind of clothing the subject's wearing? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is about clothing. Um, our, the, the sensor, as you probably know, does not see under clothing. So it's not like an airport sensor. We can work <laughs> since it's in your living room, right? So we, we can work with any kind of scan data, but with the connect, the data that we're getting is depth data that's kind of like roughly the surface of the body or the sur or surface of the clothes, kind of whatever is there. So um, yeah, our app works best with tight-fitting clothing, uh, like athletic clothing, uh, is sort of the best. So, best and, so you do, do you see an appreciable difference between um, skin tight, between a capture that's done with somebody wearing skin tight, a skin tight outfit, and something that's, you know, close but not quite so? Yeah, absolutely yes. I think it's sad, like we do. Like just sort of by accident, we do, like like men's business clothing seems to work okay, or like pretty tight jeans seem to work okay. Right, right. Skirts go nuts right now, or maybe we're doing better, but like skirts are harder because there's like all of these points here. Right, right. <laughs> um, like finding the split between the legs is sort of tricky, and it's a, it's an ongoing process. We're working on doing kind of better with clothing. We also may at some point do some real development into um, predicting what a body under clothing looks like. But what we're doing now is taking our sort of basically naked scans, um, model based on basically naked scans and trying to fit it to data that's not quite there. We just tend to predict a bigger person. Right. right. So it would, it would translate into a, 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 more, a slightly more heavy set. Right. Right. So, so being able to detect it, I think, is the, is the easiest thing. And then uh, being able to sort of ignore it and deal with it uh, is a little bit harder. And then there's another step, which is being able to model it. In other words, identifying that they're wearing clothing, actually modeling the drapes of the fabrics and the length of the pants, and being able to recover not just bodies, but like potentially complicated clothing uh, from, from Connect. And that's, uh, you know, that's further down the road. Yeah. Skeleton data is really good, just FYI. Yeah, in back.
It's a, it's a good question. A lot of the data that we're using is from, um, from a scanner which is much higher quality than the Kinect. Um, so uh, at this point, collecting uh, data from lots of people's homes, I mean, privacy issues aside, right, uh, might not actually improve upon the model. But it's certainly true that as sensors like the Kinect uh, get better and as more data like that um, becomes available, uh, we certainly uh, would like to be able to, um, to improve our models based on that. And I think there are some things that you can capture, say, with the Kinect that you can't capture with a high quality uh, scanner just because the Kinect is so portable, right? Um, so, uh, so we definitely like to be able to augment the model with data from, from the Kinect, but um, that may be further down the road. Yes. Um, sure. um, so do you have any idea with the Kinect what the um, you know, percentage error is relative to the real body? You know, do you ever measure the difference between the dimensions in your scan and the body itself? Or do you have any idea of what scale that error is on? Everybody yeah. Um. How are we from like lasers, our sort of best quality scans? So I would say that the that the data, the measurement prediction, um, that we've been able to achieve uh, from Connect is um, about half as good as you would get from a laser scan, um, and that's from the old Connect. Um, so. Um, but I don't want to comment too much about the, about the numbers. We're still working on improving them. Um, but it's definitely on our mind. I mean, we're, we're all about metric accuracy of the model, right? Okay. We want them to be precise, so. Yeah, custom clothing is actually an application that we're sort of, we're pretty interested in making happen and have had some interest in doing. So that's sort of like what we're kind of targeting. Yeah. Um, can you explain the workflow app? Yeah. So well, so we take so we take we take the the data that we captured, which includes from these four these four views, like all of the data off the sensor for a sort of short chunk of time, uh, and then uh, we we upload it to our to our server and then run our processing there. Um, and I don't know how would you summarize what our processing? I could do it, but you might. I could give you a one sentence version, but. <laughs> well, so. Um, we simulate the depth and color. Well, I guess at this point, we simulate the depth uh, images and then minimize the uh, sum of squared differences between all of the observed and the simulated pixels. So we, we basically run an optimization on the um, pose and shape of the body in the four views, keeping the shape the same across the views, um, but allowing the pose to vary slightly. Um, because if we don't have pose, we can't get shape. You say what shape and what four poses best Roughly a pose, but four poses, you know, they're a little different. Best explain the data, the data that is collected. Yeah. Yeah. For some of the reference data that you use for, sorry, no, 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 no. no. next. Some, some <laughs> of the reference data that you use for making a model, was there other additional information encoded in the data, let's say the age of the person? So was you there? Able to do some pretty interesting that's, that's, that's a great question. Um, so the, Part of the data set that we're using is, is called the CSER uh, data set, and that comes with um, quite a lot of, uh, of per person information, both about sort of anthropometric measurements and even about things like um, wh whether they're Republican or Democrat and what kind of car they drive. And um, so there's a lot. Uh, there's no body fat percentage um, that comes with it, unfortunately. We would love that. Um, but, but w what we have are the things that uh, professional anthropometers were, or anthropometrists could measure easily um, along with the, with the laser scans and then the, the registrations that we've gotten from them. Um, we can estimate the body fat, but to really get a good estimate of the body fat, I think you want to do something like an MRI or directly observe it. And doing that for thousands of people is just... Oh, of course, right. Body weight, body stature. I mean, it's probably uh, at least 70 measurements uh, taken by hand. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, motion capture. Yeah. Are you doing any scene at all? Like 
Simple. No, so so the, the motion capture stuff uh, that we're doing, I don't. I guess I could talk about that. Yeah, I don't know if I should talk about the motion capture stuff. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what Simple hey, is. One, so. one more question. Okay. Um, yeah, there was. I would love to do that, but I have not had a chance to. Well, if you have a 3D scan of a classic sculptural work, I have a museum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great, let's talk. Okay.